Daniel Crosby, welcome to the show. Awesome to be here. So you're a behavioral finance expert. What is that and how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so um, behavioral finance is just it sort of simply sits at the intersection of psychology and investment management. And so um, it, my, my path there is pretty circuitous, and that's pretty typical of the, the two handfuls of people who work in this field. So um, I, I, started, I started school as a, as a business major with an eye to going into investment management, which is which my, what, what my dad does. And then I went on a mission for my church for two years and spent, spent two years in the Philippines. And in that time, sort of got a bigger heart, enjoyed working with people, um, and came back and said, you know what, I want to do something that matters. I want to be a psychologist. Um, got about halfway through a PhD in psychology before I said, you know, this is, this is bringing me down. Uh, talking to sad people all the time is making me sad. <laughs> and I, I need to, I, I want to think deeply about why people do the things that they do, uh, but I can't do it in this context and, and still leave, uh, lead the life that I want to live. Uh, so was was lucky to stumble uh, onto this sort of unique business application of psychology, and so that takes that takes two forms. You know, part of it is helping people make better decisions, um, and then part of it is uh, can we actually manage funds in a way that takes advantage of uh, the the irrational behavior of other market participants. So you've got a new book out about using insights from behavioral psychology to be a better investor. Investor, But before we get to that, I'd like to talk about your previous book, You Are Not So Great, where you take insights from behavioral psychology to help folks live a good life. So let's talk about the title of that book, You Are Not So Great. So my mom and elementary school teachers were lying to me. Why are we aren't so great? How did this word greatness get spread too thin? Yeah, so you're not that great is kind of built on the paradox that your ability to be great uh, which I which I want for myself and everyone else, uh, but your ability to be great is predicated upon not thinking that greatness is your birthright. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm I, not sure quite how old you are. I think we're roughly the same age. But you know, I grew up in the '80s um, at sort of the height of the self-esteem movement, where the thought was that uh, self-esteem was the was the cure for all ills, and and thought that self-esteem was was given. Um, and not earned. And and that took the form of, you know, lots of gold stars, everyone's a winner, participation trophies, things like that. Um, And the the science bears out that that's not the case at all. You know, I talk about a few things, but, you know, I'll focus on two in specific. Uh, One, uh, you're not that great, talks about how special people are quitters. And I mean, make make no mistake about it. I mean, I wrote this book, it was it was a TED talk that I turned into a book. But you know, I wrote this book for myself. Um, because I was a kid who grew up, um, uh, m- many things, especially academically, came easy for me. I was praised for being, you know, special, intelligent, whatever. Um, and then I just fell apart the, the first time I quit. Uh, the first time I, I came upon e- any sort of bump in the road or any sort of obstacle, I just fell apart. And so I, I cite the work of Carol Dweck uh, quite a bit in, in the book. And she just talks about working with kids um, and, and even yourself. To focus on uh, to focus on process over outcomes. You know, I think early in my educational life, my outcomes were good because I was just uh, I was just bright and it came easy to me. But you you can only coast on that for for so long, and, and then you fall apart. So found pretty consistently in the book cases where people who just uh, are leaning back on being special don't don't get very far because they they just quit. And then the second thing that I found at citing the uh, example of Bernie Madoff is that special people are cheaters. You know, in the book, I talk about research done by uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, who worked in the New York City public school systems, and she divided kids into two groups. One she praised for being special and gifted, and the other she praised for being hardworking and following the rules. So then she asked the kid to uh, write a letter to what is turns out to be a, a fictional pen pal. And in this letter to this pen pal, she's, uh, they're supposed to uh, tell a little bit about the things they like to do, their hobbies, and then they're supposed to transcribe uh, their report card. Well, uh, of the group that were praised for being hardworking and following the rules, nobody fudged the grades on the report card. Uh, but of the group praised for being special and gifted, nearly half of the kids gave themselves better grades than, than they had actually received. So they effectively lied uh, when writing to their pen pal. And we see this also in the case of Bernie Madoff. You know, a lot of people don't understand that Bernie Madoff was already enormously wealthy and successful, 
before he started <clears throat> defrauding Holocaust victims. You know, he had already invented a market making technology uh, that serves as uh, part of what we now know as NASDAQ. So he had made all this money, tens of millions of dollars, but he said he never felt special. He never felt special. He says uh, in his deposition that he felt like a picked on little Jewish kid from Brooklyn. So again, he needed to be special, never got there in his mind. And you see that in both, case, both cases, it led to cheating. So that's the second reason is that special people are cheaters. Yeah, and I think that ties in with research I've um, seen about straight A students or kids who think of themselves as straight A students or gifted students. Is they're, they're, they're the ones who are more likely to cheat. Um, and I even saw this like anecdotally in my own life, the, the really the ki- friends I were with that had this pressure of being the smart kid, like they cheated all the time, like on tests or they would, you know, look at someone's homework so they, cause they didn't have time to do the homework the night before. So they would ask for their friend, they would copy their answers very rampant. And it was because they had this pressure to like maintain that image. Absolutely. I saw that in my own life. I mean, frankly, everyone writes a book uh, to themselves, I think is the case. And uh, this was absolutely written for me. You know, I was early on labeled gifted and a smart kid uh, and didn't have to work very hard for it. So I learned bad skills and I learned to sort of coast on my natural gifts uh, and then ended up being a pretty horrible student for a lot of years and a very lazy, uh, lazy cheater, frankly, and had to sort of reteach myself later in life how to function uh, because I had been given bad messages and, and hadn't taken personal responsibility. And I mean, what did you have to do? Like, how did you reprogram well, yourself? I, uh, it, I was a horrible student all through middle school and high school, um, had to go to a junior college, um, had to go to a junior college because my grades were so poor. Um, and it was at that point that it really sort of dawned on me that I was going to live in a van down by the river if I didn't get things together. Um, and so at that point, I really uh, started to work hard, got great, you know, great grades my first year of junior college, went on a mission for my church where I grew up quite a bit. And, and then after that, I was on a better path. So you talk about contingent self-esteem and the two responses that humans take towards it. What are the what, what is contingent self-esteem and what are our typical responses towards it? So contingent self-esteem is self-esteem that's basically predicated on uh, your self-esteem is predicated on someone else's lack of self-esteem. So the the two things that we tend to do are either we build ourselves up uh, to sort of this unrealistic uh, Unrealistic, unrealistic level of overconfidence, or else we feel like we have to put others down. And in study after study, people, uh, it's been shown that people would rather make uh, less money if it means making more money than their neighbors, right? So you'd, you'd rather be uh, poor in a neighborhood where you're slightly richer than your neighbors than to be more objectively wealthy. So we really think about wealth and success and all these things in relative terms, and it's contingent on the people around us. Gotcha. And how do you overcome that? You know, I think the I think the the answers that I, I give in the book are just really sort of old fashioned and and simple, but not easy. I mean, I think you have to learn to develop sort of a personal benchmark for greatness to to compare yourself today to the man you were yesterday, and, and not to your neighbor. And then the second thing that's just uh, unequivocal in the research on self-esteem is that there's no shortcut to self-esteem. And the only way that you can get genuine self-esteem is by doing hard things and persisting in doing hard things until you've achieved something uh, noteworthy. So people have a really strong BS meter. And so if you're telling someone, hey, well, you know, I'm so proud of you, you did so great when they didn't really work for it, it doesn't stick. It's only when we do hard stuff and, and learn to do it well that that gets internalized. Gotcha. So let's talk about your latest book, The Laws of Wealth, uh, where you take a look at the research coming out of behavioral psychology on how people can invest their money better. Because I think for a lot of just average Joes, like investing money in the stock market is just super intimidating. Uh, I mean, I I invest and like, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy, but like even like I'll look at the stock market, like I don't understand how this thing, this thing, this crazy thing works. Um, but in, the, in the, the book, you make the case that most investing comes down to behavioral management. Uh, it's not so much you know, what you put in your portfolio. I mean, that, that is important, but more importantly is how you just manage your behavior when you, go, when you invest. So what are the, the biggest behavioral or psychological ticks that get in the way of us making wise investing decisions? 
Yeah. So, so the first thing you mentioned there is one of the most powerful is just not realizing how empowered we are. Um, you know, Ben Graham, who taught Warren Buffett everything he knows, uh, Buffett would say, uh, says that the investor's chief problem is, is himself. And that is absolutely, again, what the research bears out. There's, uh, there's research by a, a company called Dalbar that talks about the gap between what the market return has been and what the average mutual fund investor has gotten. Um, and like over the last 30 years, the market has given you about eight and a quarter percent. Uh, but the average investor in the market has only kept about half of that uh, because they get in and they get out at, at the wrong times. And so the first law of wealth, if you will, is just realizing that your behavior matters so much. And so financial professionals get this. You know, a recent, a recent study I read said that 83% 83, 83 of financial advisors said the, the biggest thing that they do for their clients is hold their hands and keep them from freaking out. Uh, but only 6% of the end clients thought that was the case. So there's this real disconnect where clients are, are looking for um, this sort of expert investment management, which is, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, an, an effort and futility, whereas the real value is delivered by just keeping you from making a handful of stupid decisions over your lifetime. Gotcha. So they're more of like a coach. Yeah, more of a coach. And people don't want to see them that way. People want them stock picking and uh, doing the sexy stuff. And, and really, uh, they're saving you from, their, from yourself if they're doing it right. Gotcha. So, I mean, you list in the book several biases that we have that um, that make us that cause us to create, you know, make poor decisions. Um, so, you mentioned earlier, like the we get out whenever things are tanking, and then we get in when things are awesome. What bias is going on there that causes us to, uh, I guess, it's sell high and or no, it's sell low, buy high. So I guess is what people are doing. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a number of things at, at play there, but one of the things that's at play is something called the, the affect heuristic, which is just a fancy way of saying that your emotions color your perceptions of risk. And so um, there's been studies about emergency room admissions on days that the market is down. And emergency rooms uh, uh, admissions dramatically uh, skyrocket whenever the market crashes. So we are just so immersed in this, and it's such a big part of our lives um, that it, it has an impact on our mood. So if you're in a bad mood, you tend to see risk everywhere. Uh, if you're in a great mood, you you tend to not be very tuned into risk. And there's there's interesting there's interesting research on this with respect to um, the spread of sexually transmitted diseases as well. It's like when people are uh, in a cold emotional state, they know exactly what they're supposed to do um, to have safe sex. And then when people are feeling amorous, it's like kind of all out the door. So. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's managing those emotions. And this is why I wrote a book on what I call rule-based behavioral investing, just trying to set forth a couple of simple rules so that you can kind of put this process on autopilot and really not think about it um, because your thinking is colored by your emotion. Gotcha. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So um, how, how do most people invest their money? I mean, so like you, you promote this thing called goals-based investing, um, how is that different from the way most people go about investing their money? Yeah, so the, the traditional model of finance has, has talked about uh, mean variance optimization, which we totally won't get into, but it's basically trying to get the most return for every, uh, every extra bit of risk you take on. And so in this paradigm, your goal is to try and beat the benchmark, let's say. So you want to do, you want your portfolio to do better than whatever uh, you're measuring it against. So let's just say for stocks, you want your portfolio to beat the S&P 500. Okay. So there's, that's intuitive enough. But what I'm saying is uh, you want the best anxiety adjusted returns uh, because we're all different. We all have different goals. We all have different wants and needs. We all have different meanings of wealth and expectations about how we want to live. And so all you need is the returns, uh, you want to maximize the probability that you get the returns you want to live the life that, that you want to live. And that looks very different for different people. And that, uh, that requires a deep consideration of what matters to you uh, from sort of a meaning and purpose standpoint. And that uh, requires a deep consideration of your personal risk tolerance. And uh, traditional modes of finance have sort of uh, kept that static across all market participants and assumed sort of 
similar goals and, and similar uh, risk appetites. And obviously that's not the case. And so with goals-based investing, the goal isn't to beat the market. It's just- no, the, right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So one, one of the studies on goals-based investing that I love is they were they were working with um, low income savers, like people who are just barely scraping by. Um, and they're, they're rightly having a hard time setting aside money. And so they tried carrots and sticks, you know, rewards and punishments. And then finally they said, you know what, we're going to try this. We're going to prime these people with a picture of their children um, before they make a financial decision. We're going to sort of flash up a picture of their children before they make a, a decision to spend or save. And we'll see how that impacts it. And with these low income folks, it, it helped them set aside more than 200% more money than they had been before, just when they were thinking about that, that meaning and purpose before making a financial decision. So goals-based investing simply tries to reconnect money with the life that it serves. So this was interesting. You had a whole section about index fund investing. I'm a big index fund guy. That's what I do. Um, but you, and because like you, you highlight, even highlight in the book, the reasons why index funds are so appealing is that actively managed funds, right? Where there's a guy in charge, he's selling and you know rearranging the fund in order to get the best return. Those don't do very well compared to the S&P 500. In fact, most people, most of them don't, don't even meet their benchmark. But you still make the case that actively managed funds might be better than index funds. I'm curious, why is that? So um, this is, I think, a conversation that takes a lot of nuance. So I'm gonna I'm gonna draw on the words of a guy uh, that I I love his stuff, Nassim Taleb, who wrote the Black Swan, and he says, "Never ask a man his opinion; only ask to see his portfolio." So I'll tell you uh, that when I was recently putting together my will, um, and and putting together this, you know, for my wife who doesn't uh, isn't as interested in investing as I am, I said. If I get hit by a truck tomorrow, <clears throat> here are the allocations and put it all in Vanguard. Because if you just want to not worry about it and manage fees, which is a great way to go, um, there is, it's, it's hard to beat index investing. So that said, I think that people who care enough to give it a little time and attention can do better than indexing over long periods of time. Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. So uh, before I sort of go into that, I want to say that for the average investor who doesn't care about these things and just wants to live their life and set aside a little money each month, index investing and, and diversifying across many asset classes is absolutely the way to go. Um, so there are a couple of psychological problems with, with indexing, though, I, I think. And one of them is that most indexing tends to concentrate you in the largest and most expensive stocks, uh, which have historically not done that well. So the, the way that an index works is a stock takes up a bigger or smaller percentage of an index um, based on how well it's done recently and how uh, the, the market cap of that company, so how big it is. And so if you have an index like the S&P 500, you are overweight companies that are large and expensive, which of course, um, you're, you're in effect uh, buying high and buying big. And over time, smaller stocks outperform larger stocks and cheap stocks outperform expensive stocks. So with, with that in mind, I think there are some small tweaks that you can uh, do to, to make it a little better. Um, the other thing that I talk about in the book is how a lot of people think of indexes as being sort of um, mined from the earth or existing in a natural state. And what, what we see is that the, the S&P 500, again, is uh, uh, nine, uh, a secret group of nine people decides which stocks go in the S&P 500. So uh, unfortunately, these nine people are subject to the same errors and bias thinking that you or I are. And so they've tended to do the wrong thing again. They've tended, um, you know, at the turn of the century, the S&P 500 was loaded with tech stocks. Uh, to agree that was sort of uh, not historically where they had been, but they loaded the boat with tech stocks because of the, the mania going on in the tech world at the time. And they were uh, grossly overweight banking stocks uh, in the 2000, 2007, 2008. And so because of this bias on their part, uh, you, you, the investor, get screwed um, by their bias entering the equation. So I'm talking about... Uh, 
what I call rules-based behavioral investing, if, if you put it on a continuum between what's commonly referred to as passive investing is act, and active investing, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Gotcha. I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Um, so as I was reading that whole thing about index funds, like, hmm, maybe I should switch strategies. Um, but there's all these, but I, I'm, but at the same time, like, man, like, I, I don't know if I can have, I have the time to like twiddle with my portfolio all the time. There are these companies coming out, uh, like Wealthfront, where they, I'm not, I forgot what the other one is, where they basically create your portfolio via algorithm. Are they applying some of the, the research and behavioral science and just that to help people create a, a portfolio that fits for them? So uh, th- there's a couple of things that Wealthfront and Betterment, those are sort of the big two, and they're, they're referred to in the industry as robo-advisors. So I think there's a couple of things they do well, and I think there's a couple of things that are either uh, room for improvement or we haven't, m- maybe they haven't been fully tested yet. So what they do exceptionally well uh, is they, they allocate you across a number of assets in a very scientific way. I mean, it's, it's unbeatable. It's very, very good. Uh, the way that they diversify your portfolio and do so uh, with with reasonable fees. So that that aspect is is hard to beat. Um, I think where the where the jury is still out, most of these companies are relatively new, um, and they haven't really seen periods of great market volatility. Most of these companies are like five, six, seven years old, and I mean it's been a great it's been a great seven years. So what we find in the research is that people who work with a financial professional tend to outperform those who don't uh, pretty dramatically by about 2 to 3% a year. And it's not because financial advisors are good stock pickers. It's because they're holding your hand and they're keeping you invested uh, when times are tough. They're, they're a coach again. And so I, I think where the jury is still out for me with, with robo-advisors is how do their participants react um, in a, very, in a you know, a 30 40 50% drawdown? And interestingly, this week, you know, we're talking the week of uh, the week after the Brexit vote, and uh, I believe it was Monday of this week. Betterment actually shut down; um, they, they made their funds illiquid, like you couldn't get to your account. So they basically said, "Hey, um, you know, we feel like people are going to make dumb decisions today," which they were, to be fair, probably right about. They said, "You know, we think people are going to make d- dumb decisions today, so we're just going to lock up your money." Well. Um, you know, maybe that's well-meaning, but it's also sort of not what their investors signed up for. So uh, it'll be interesting for me to see how they try and manage the behavioral side of this over time. But their uh, their their credentials in diversifying your portfolio are, are unassailable. Um, so we talked about some of the rules um, kind of tangentially, uh, and I know we can't get into the specifics of all of them, but what are some of the rules in your rule-based investing uh, idea that people can follow to start being a better investor. Yeah, so one one of the things that I talk about uh, is consistency. So just having rules. I mean, and you know, uh, whether it's as simple as setting aside X amount of dollars each month, or just making a hard and fast rule to you know buy every dip of ten percent or more, just just so you don't have to think about it. I mean, there's just an increasing literature on how really exceptional people just try and uh, streamline their decision-making process. And I think this is this sort of checklist manifesto mentality is more applicable to investing than just about anywhere else. I mean, you see people like Obama who wear the same, you know, the same two types of suits day in and day out. You know, people like Nick Saban who eat the same thing for breakfast and lunch every day. You just want to free up that headspace for the stuff that matters. And I mean, investing, you know, it frankly doesn't matter very much <laughs> in terms of living in terms of living a great life. So consistency is one of the things that I advocate. Um, the, the other thing that I talk about is conviction, which you know it's uh, uh, back to the active versus passive debate. It's a it's a dirty little secret in the in the investing world that most most funds that are marketed as being active don't differ meaningfully from their benchmark, and so what you get is expensive index funds, basically. Um, and so you're eroding your performance. And a, a, a recent study found that basically three quarters of funds that were marketed as active didn't really have an opinion. They were just basically what we call closet indexes. And so that's, that's another principle, is, is 
be in one camp or, or be in another camp, either, either index like you do, which is sensible and a great approach and, and just save your fees or, or seek out a fund that's truly differentiated and, and has an opinion, but never, never be in the middle. All right. So consist- consistency and conviction. Yeah. It's one of those, those two, I guess they're two C's. Yeah. Um, so before we go, I mean, we've talked uh, about living a good life finances. We've got to talk about this other book you wrote because when you, I remember I got in the mail, I was like, what in the world is this? It's, it's a book for kids and it's a child, child's book about how people die. And I, I think it's called Everyone You Know Will Die, right? Everyone You Love Will Die. It's a little more morbid than you thought. Right. Everyone You Love Will Die. Uh, I'm curious, what was the impetus behind writing this book and why, I mean, why did you do it? So, um, to, to scare the children of America. No, um, I wrote this book. So I have two children and next week I'll have three children. So I have, you know, soon, soon to be three children and, uh, you know, they're the loves of my life. And one of, uh, one of the great struggles for me is finding ways to talk about them, uh, talk with them about sort of the tough realities that we all have to confront. Um, and so I found that I, I do this well and that it's, it gives me a window to talk to them if I, if I write it out as a poem first. So it's almost like I get my thoughts straight with writing a children's poem, read this to them, and then we kind of bond over this and then we can have a, a meaningful discussion over it. So I've written, I've written poems about everything from uh, you know, gay marriage to being, a, being an individual to uh, everyone you love will die. And so Everyone You Love Will Die was the first one I wrote. And I I wrote this poem when I was um, talking to my daughter, I believe, after her fish died. (laughs) And uh, so I was talking to my my oldest child about this. And I put it on Facebook. I put it on Facebook and I said, hey, this is just kind of a funny thing I did. And it is ultimately hopeful and, and hopefully endearing and encourages you to spend time and make the most of every moment with the people that you love. So I, I throw this thing on Facebook. The next day, a friend of mine sends me a file that she's illustrated this poem. So long story short, we put it on Kickstarter. Kickstarter made it their pick of the day. It was funded in like five hours. And, uh, you know, we got enough money to print off a couple hundred books. That's awesome. So Memento Mori for your toddler. Yeah, Memento Mori for your toddler. Yeah, I love that. I love that concept. Yeah, I think they need that. And it, I mean, it is true. Like, I think particularly in our modern world, I mean, even adults, like we're so hidden, like we're so um, shielded from death, right? I mean, I can I can count on like maybe you know one hand, not probably more than that, but like the number of people I've known that have died and um, experienced that. So yeah, I mean, and the kids even more so. We shield them from that stuff, but like that's a natural part of life. We- well, yeah, and for me, uh, the reality of death is one of the things that most effectively animates me to try and live a meaningful life. And I think that that we we leave that value on the table when we when we hide from it. And the 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 weird paradox is in a in a day and age where you turn on the TV on any given Tuesday and there's been a, you know a suicide bombing or a mass shooting. It's almost like death has become so ubiquitous that we're almost even that much more detached from it. So um, I, I think there's an appropriate and a meaningful way to reflect on the inevitability of, of loss as a way to animate a better life. That's awesome. Well, Daniel, this has been a great conversation. Where can people learn more about uh, your different books you've got out there? Yeah, so uh, go check out The Laws of Wealth on Amazon. You can go to everyoneyoulovewilldie.com <laughs> if you're uh, so so moved. You can follow me on Twitter at Daniel Crosby, and my uh, wealth management firm is Nocturne Capital. Awesome. Daniel Crosby, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. My guest today was Daniel Crosby. He's the author of the book, The Laws of Wealth. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out the show notes at aom.is slash Crosby for links to resources mentioned throughout the show.